Today we're going to talk about Galileo. Now, many of you have already seen uh, the impact that Galileo had in the 1600s. When I played the game myself, I didn't realize how important or how many discoveries he had made at that time. In the Trial of Galileo game, there were several things that were covered in terms of the science. The first I'm going to talk about is the moon. Here's Galileo's own sketch of the moon. What's the first thing that you see on it? Craters. He was the first to really do a good job of sketching and recognizing that they were craters. He had no clue what caused them. And we wouldn't have a really good clue as to what caused them until the 1960s. For about 300 years or so, or, or more, people were thinking that, that these had to be volcanic in origin, that they had to be volcanoes because they're round. And the only thing that we knew of that made round holes like that would be volcanoes. By the time we were actually sending uh, people to the moon in the 60s, uh, we realized that that probably wasn't the, the case. In fact, it was probably big rocks that would hit the moon and explode. And that explosion would go in all directions and create a big hole uh, that would eventually get filled in with lava. This is the, the Daedalus crater, one of the largest ones that were seen by the Apollo astronauts on the far side of the moon. So we had no clue that this was even there until uh, we were flying around the moon in, 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 in the 60s. Aside from just planting a flag on the moon, we actually did a little bit of science and realized that by collecting rocks and bringing them back to Earth, that they were very different than the rocks on Earth, but not so different that, it, that the moon could be completely unrelated to the Earth. As it turned out that the formation of the moon had to come from something about the size of Mars hitting Earth, spewing off a lot of material into space that would eventually orbit the proto-Earth and coalesce down into what we now call our moon. Very recently, people were arguing about uh, how fast that collision was. It something that was very much of an impact? And it turns out that if it actually hit like this, like this artist's conception showed, that it would completely evaporate the moon, there would be nothing. It had to have actually been a fairly slow collision such that it wouldn't completely evaporate things and have a blast wave like in Star Wars. You guys see the Death Star, the Star Wars explosion? If it actually hit faster, it would blow off so much material that we couldn't have formed the moon. So it had to be a relatively slow collision. Uh, that would cause that sort of thing. More recently in looking at the craters, we've sent uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter there uh, just a few years ago to try and map out and figure out what the craters are like on the moon, how deep they are, and more specifically, where could we live on the moon if we went there? There's, the, there's not a lot of natural resources there, but if you go to the craters at the South Pole, and this is the South Pole of the moon, there are spots where literally the sun never shines. They're very cold spots and any water molecule that ends up anywhere on the moon will eventually bounce its way around the moon because it, get, it is evaporated and then condenses into ice and evaporating condenses into ice until it finds a permanently cold spot. And LRO, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, found several spots at the South Pole uh, that are dark here that were, are spots where the sun never shines, where there's likely ice. Also, it found spots where the sun never sets, where the sun is always above the horizon. So the edges of some of these craters have sunlight all year round. The advantages of that is if you're going to build a, a base for astronauts, you would want to build it somewhere in between here and here so that you could have your solar panels able to uh, get sunlight and energy all year round, but then you could just send out a little robot to scoop up some ice, bring it back, melt it down, and make yourself some beverages. Uh, so this mission is there to try and figure out where could we live if we went there. However, my favorite piece of, of this is that uh, LRO actually imaged the old Apollo 11 sites that I have several students in my own astronomy classes that, that sometimes think that we didn't land on the moon. And have argued for years, well, why don't you just send a picture? Guess what? We've got the pictures now. And not only can you see the spacecraft uh, over there, you can also see astronaut footprints where they were shuffling their feet to get from place to place. And so, yes, not only can we see the lander and see all the equipment that they left behind, uh, we can actually see where, where they walked, uh, which is pretty impressive. Uh, 
Another of uh, Galileo's observations were sunspots. He made these observations <coughs> in, in uh, a nice summer in July. Watch what happens. Each day, observing them at the same time, he would see these little dots move around. That creation and destruction of sunspots was fairly random, but you would notice that some years had a lot and some had very few. In our modern era, we realize that the number of sunspots changes fairly regularly every 11 years. So we'll have a year where we have, have solar maximum and a lot of sunspots, a lot of solar activity, then about five and a half years later, relatively little activity, and then another five and a half years, it goes back up to where it was. That's what Galileo saw pretty much during his own lifetime. And then something weird happened. Uh, three years after he died, all the sunspots went away. <laughs> That's a fairly odd thing. Uh, completely coincidental, but if you were a scientist at the time, you might have argued that, that that Galileo was just seeing things, and then after he dies, and then the sunspots were completely bogus. This was actually the Maunder minimum, uh, the middle of the Little Ice Age, that there, that there was a time when Europe froze over, and we think it's very likely due to the fact that there was this change in solar activity, that we quit having sunspots for about 50 <coughs> years, and we quit having the aurora borealis for about 50 years, and Europe froze over. This is a painting. Um, done in 1677 of the Thames in London, completely frozen over with giant ice sheets. That's not how it is normally in London. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been there, but you don't normally see that river turn into a giant ice sheet like that. After the, we got out of the Little Ice Age, that quit happening. But this, this uh, modern minimum, I think, is indicative of some of the issues that are facing scientists that are looking at global warming issues right now and to say how much of an effect does the sun have, have on uh, our own current climate. Gauging those sunspots is the only historical record we have for how active the sun was then. What causes those sunspots? Here's a close-up picture of sunspots. In our visible light with our eyes, we can just see the spots, but it turns out those are just a surface feature. Those aren't the cause of, of what's going on at all. In reality, there are these huge magnetic fields. And if we look with ultraviolet eyes, if we take ultraviolet telescopes and look at the sun instead, we see these huge magnetic fields coming out of the sun and going into the sun. And the spots themselves, those little dots, are only a symptom of where the magnetic field goes into the sun or comes out of the sun. And they change fairly regularly. Here's a movie done by the Trace uh, experiment, a satellite that was launched, that shows how these ch are, have particles that are flowing along the magnetic field lines, dive bombing into the sun or shooting out of the sun all the time. Indeed, it, the first observations on sunspots with our eyes was just the beginning of figuring out how the sun is, is affecting Earth and, what, and uh, what's going on inside the sun. And by looking with eyes that can see just past violet into the violet, we can see the true cause of these things, these strong magnetic fields. Uh, something that uh, you might have used if you were arguing uh, as a pro-Galilean player in the game uh, was that Jupiter's moons were very useful in trying to, to uh, prove that the sun was at the center of the solar system. Here's Galileo's first sketch of the moons of Jupiter. I've had to zoom in a little bit on this one, but he's just drawn a few little stars around the planet. We've got a lot better view of these today, uh, largely because instead of looking from Earth with a small telescope, we send a much bigger telescope. This is the Galileo spacecraft, which we sent to Jupiter uh, to take pictures of it and the moons. Uh, here it's being launched out of the space shuttle. We see that these moons aren't just dead objects uh, like our own moon, but are very active and, and alive in, in multiple senses of that word, possibly. Uh, this is uh, the closest of those moons, Io. This is the most geologically active object in the solar system. It's so close to Jupiter that the tidal forces of Jupiter and the other moons stretch and pull it all the time, such that like if you were to take a a uh, paper clip or a wire and bend it back and forth, it gets hot right before it breaks. This thing is being heated internally because it's being stretched and pulled. 
it's got stuff shooting out of it all the time. Here's a more recent picture taken by the New Horizons mission on its way to Pluto, uh, showing both Jupiter and Io. If you look closely, you see something shooting out of Io at the top side, that little blue, blue speck. Those are sulfur dioxide geysers, blasting material from the inside of, of Io uh, out into space and, and then re-blanketing the surface of Io. It's very much like what we have on Earth with water geysers. Uh, here's uh, Ansel Adams' famous photograph of um, Old Faithful in Yellowstone Park. The same process that we have here, where there's hot rock uh, that underground that heats up water and shoots it through cracks in, the, in the, the ground so that it shoots off into space, is the same thing that's happening on Io. The difference is on Io, uh, you're not shooting water, you're shooting um, sulfur dioxide. And the other difference is, since Io's smaller, it has less gravity, so things can go further into space. And since it doesn't have an atmosphere, there's nothing to, to cause any friction. So th these jets can shoot well into space, uh, much more so than, than jets on Earth do. Perhaps more interesting than that geologically active moon was this moon, Europa, the next one out. Europa is covered with ice. And here we're looking at small little cracks in the ice of it. Uh, but it's heated on the inside just like Europa is. Not enough so that it's got lava uh, and huge volcanoes, but enough to keep the inside of it warm, even though it's a relatively small planet. Now what happens if you take ice and heat it up on the inside? You get water. And here we see spots on the surface of Io where there were, was a sheet of ice that now seems to be floating away, broken up and floating away from other spots on the ice, uh, indicating that there's something that's uh, warmer underneath the surface than this hard, brittle ice. Odds are that it's one of two things. You either have cold, brittle ice on the surface and some, some ice, but much, much warmer below the surface, or you have a liquid water ocean. Based on the measurements of the magnetic field, and models of the temperature, it's quite likely that if you go about a mile down in the ice, there is a liquid water ocean on Europa. And if you have an ocean of liquid water that sits around for four and a half billion years, what is to stop life from taking root there? We've already seen lots of life that live off of our own ocean floor that use the heat of the earth as a source of energy. There's nothing to stop that from happening here. And uh, very recently, we found forms of life that we called extremophiles that we never thought could exist at the bottom of uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Here are some methane ice worms. And this is just a little bit larger than reality. They're about one to two inches in length. These things live off of methane ice. They don't need another source of energy to, to survive. It's quite likely that these things could be the aliens, or something like them, could be the aliens that live on, on a planet or a moon like Europa. In fact, if you look at them up close, they really do look like aliens. So this is a, a close-up of one of their heads. So Galileo may have discovered, uh, it, or maybe it will show in time, that Galileo discovered the, the objects that have life somewhere else in our solar system. Uh, We'll need to, to go out there, drill down a mile into the ice to look for it, but it's quite possible that it's there. Let's go to the big picture, though, the universe as a whole. When Galileo looked at, um, at uh, things like the Pleiades, he saw instead of just having uh, six stars, that there were several other stars in the background. And he had a pretty decent map. If we take a deep picture with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, We'll see that if you build a bigger telescope, there are a lot more stars. We live in what we believe is an infinite universe. At Galileo's time, and actually up until the turn of the century, in the early 1900s, we thought that our own galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, which we are, are within, was the entire universe. That there were no other galaxies. The concept of saying a galaxy far, far away was ridiculous because as as uh, late as the 1930s, we thought that the Milky Way galaxy was it. 
here's what the Milky Way galaxy looks like if you go to a dark spot uh, on Earth, uh, and as it looks like from the inside. But Edwin Hubble took images and spectra of little fuzzy spots in the sky, including this thing, the Andromeda galaxy. And it turns out that we live in a universe where there are other galaxies, where there's not just the Milky Way galaxy, but there are several island universes, billions of stars all clustered together, but separated by millions of light years. We actually have named uh, our, the, the best telescope that we've got, the Hubble Space Telescope, after Edwin Hubble, who made that discovery in the 30s. And it's taken even, even deeper pictures. This is uh, perhaps the, the, the deepest that we've ever seen into space with uh, visible light. Here we're looking at a universe, every single one of those dots, uh, with the exception of this one, which is a foreground star, represents a galaxy. And each galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars in it. This was an exposure that uh, was basically leaving the camera open for two weeks and looking into the darkest part of the sky that you could possibly look. And so if you point to the, the place in the sky that looks the, the absolute blackest of blacks and leave the camera open for two weeks, you see that there's still a lot of stuff there. As we're looking at them, we're actually seeing back in time. If you look at a star that's one light year away, you see it as it was one year ago. If you look at stars that are 100 light years away, you see them as they were 100 years ago. If you look at light that is coming at you from 13.7 billion years ago, you're seeing 13.7 billion years away, all the way back to the Big Bang. To see that, we have to look not with visible light, with, but with microwave lights or cameras. The Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, WMAP, was able to see what the universe looked like almost immediately after the Big Bang itself. With it, we were, have been able to determine with three significant digits how old the universe we live in is, which is something that has only happened within the past few years. This is how it began. Small little perturbations in the temperature that would eventually grow up to be the galaxies that we see in, in the other pictures. Bruno was right. Everyone that uh, at the time would have considered him a heretic, but he was absolutely correct that we live in a uni a, an infinite universe, that it expands uh, outward forever, and perhaps most importantly and most interestingly, that those other stars in other galaxies very likely have planets orbiting uh, around them. <coughs> uh, we've since the 1990s, we've discovered about 300 other planets. Uh, the most recent picture, and the only picture that we have of a good one, is here. This is the star Fomalhaut. It's only about 25 light years away, so not far compared to a lot of stars. It's hard to pick out, but this little dot right here is the first picture that we have of a planet going around another star. In fact, if we zoom in on it, we see where it was in 2004, where it was in 2006. This study was published in 2008. This thing is about the mass of Jupiter. That for, that this is an exciting time to be alive because when you were born, uh, we had one solar system, ours. Now we have 300, we have pictures of other worlds. We are soon going to figure out exactly how special we are uh, in this universe. Uh, and largely what we have to thank is the, is the creation of a telescope and the expansion of that telescope. And it's just amazing to me how so many of these discoveries all boil back to Galileo Galilei. Thanks for your time today.